thing. Her own interpretation. She, she thought she was superior to Quinn. Uh, well, I think she, she thought she was superior to everyone, didn't she? Huh? She thought she was superior to everyone. Yes. She said, I'm much, <laughs> Maybe she I, was. I'm much more ancient than he is. Uh, she saw herself as this earth mother going back to Atlantis. Well, I wouldn't be able to surprise yeah. if she was. Right. She had to be an old soul. Yes, well, she was certainly. A very old soul. And this is, this is my prototype for the poster. Unfortunately, my, my patron died. Oh. Sir Paul Getty died because I was making a movie for him on oh. his private cricket ground. Oh, and so how it's, wonderful. It's the arrangement in white on green. The white uniforms on the green grass. Oh. oh. And, uh, and this is that you were planning this one? And Jack got? Cardiff agreed to be my cameraman. Oh. oh. He was 89. Uh, what a shame. But this is just a prototype. I mean, otherwise, yeah. it would have been. You were going to do a film about the mystique of cricket? Yes, and I studied cricket and everything, believe me. And it's, it has Celtic roots. Uh -huh. Like they come out and they tap they, with the sticks. They tap the ground three times. They have all these ritual things. That goes back to Celtic times because they're awakening the Earth Mother. Uh -huh. Things like that, you know. It's got an amazing background. And, and isn't the Celtic, uh, the ancient Celtic religion related to Druidism? Older than that, Druidism was sort of an invention in the 18th century. It doesn't really, I mean, that's the name they gave to it. To Stonehenge and all that, but it really uh, There's is no such older. thing, really. Yeah. Uh. Who designed the poster? I did. This is just a prototype. Yeah. I mean, I mean the, the final one. Oh, I've got a picture. This is a picture that um, a test that Jack Carter did for me. This is the way the film would look. 35 millimeter. 10 days with Jack Carter. And he's a cricket expert. You know. It's a tragedy. That I, and I had... And, you know, and the music is uh, Sir Edward Algar, uh, so it's an hour long, and it's his unfinished third symphony. This is the way the film would have looked. And that's one of the top cricketers that agreed to be in the film. See, he calls it the Getty 11. He has his own team that he keeps on salary a whole, whole year long. Right, and they would play in the backyard. And mm -hmm. they play for six months. Not a backyard, it was a huge cricket ground. All the, um, the upper crust watching. It was on his property, correct? Absolutely, yeah. The whole valley was turned into his private cricket ground. Oh, that would have been a beautiful photograph. And I would have used slow motion extensively. And people would say, oh, well. He's just copying uh, Lenny Riefenstahl in col color. Well, what's wrong with that? Of course, it was the same. <laughs> that sounds like a good idea to me. I mean, it was that approach to sports as if it were religion, like she did in Olympia. You know, I mean, she was like worshiping the human body. People say, well, that's very fascist to worship the human body. Well, that's a bunch of bullshit. It is. I mean, I mean it happens to be just be beauty is beauty, as, as Lenny said. Beauty is beauty. And I said, well, weren't there ugly things when you went to the uh, new photograph the Nubians? Like, weren't there people that had horrible diseases and amputees and cripples and things? She said, yes, she would never photograph any of that. She only photographed the beautiful things. So she'd like pushed all that out of the way. You know, because of course there were people that had skin she diseases. She created an idealized Absolutely, yeah. world. Yeah. It's the transmutation into art. No, but the Nuba tribe, now they're nearly extinct. They've been having the Civil War there and killing them off by the thousands. So she doesn't make it very sad. Well, let's hear that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to show you a couple more things. This is the Burncrant collection. I want to film for the media, for the Rockefeller Foundation. Oh. This is their great big figure of Mickey Mouse 
big carved wood thing that was from a European merry-go-round, this figure. You see the variations on the theme of Mickey Mouse uh, that are totally mm -hmm. just taking off from the Disney idea, but into another realm completely. Mm -hmm. And this is my friend Eunice, the Mel's wife. She the collector? Yeah, she. And, and this is their, just, you can just look at the pictures. I sent this in, with, you can have that one if you want. Wow. I sent it in to the, this gives you an idea of their wow. living oh space. Oh my God. Well, nobody gets in there but me. In other words, <laughs> uh, they will not let any Should other be. collectors get in to see it. And, and I've known them for 30 years, and they trust me completely. But no one else can get into their places, and they don't want the exact place they live. No, it's on the it's in the upper hub, Hudson, across from West Point. But they don't want because they're terrified that someone will break in and try to steal things. That's why they should be. Because the uh, coll uh, collectors like maniacs, you know, they, a little Mickey Mouse story they'd kill for it. Oh boy! I bet you when they go to sleep at night, these things just get up and call any, any rate, um, havoc. Mel and Eunice have agreed to let me film there for 10 days and to see very complicated. Everything has to be taken out of the plexiglass cases. I can't photograph with the plexi in front of them. No. And that's a whole very delicate operation. But Mel said he'd do it for me. And it's called Mouse Heaven. And the place is. The burn back towards the and what I think what I think I'll do is oh. um, is um, at the same time that we film everything and they're taken out of the glass or the plexiglass places and everything and lit especially, we'll make eight by ten negatives of each one with a viewfinder camera that, like they used to make stills with in the old days sure. in Hollywood, you know, those plates. And then we'll have an album and book. Or we'll have it for the stills will be turned into a accompanying book called Mouse Heaven, a, a coffee table book. We'll probably sell for $100 or something. Because all the work will be done. I mean, right. you know, we might as well take a still of every setup. And document it. And it'll be basically just pictures, not, not a text book. I mean, it may have a little text. In fact, Maybe an interview. Their, their friend, uh, Maurice Sendak, would write the introduction. I mean, he's a recognized yeah. name. He's one of their best friends. My friend lives with him now. What? My friend lives with him now. Jonathan Weinberg that you met when we went to Cal really? Arts. Yeah. They, he was he gave them a house on dog. their he had ground. He this dog that was about 20 years old and the dog died. And he was broken up for about five years over that dog. And, and these are things that I wanted. <clears throat> these are part of my uh, Hollywood Icon show. Like I wanted. To reproduce this up with oh the, the, the inkjet system, only blow this up so it's like billboard size. Because it's an amazing image. And I have all this material on Valentino that's absolutely meant perfect. That's fantastic. From <laughs> but, the, it's from the Strong Museum. But for the exhibit I want to do, I want this huge, you know, not this size, but. Absolutely huge. Exactly like that, but huge. I mean, you just, there's a way to copy it uh, with uh, like a billboard type technology. Hollywood dollies. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, how wonderful. Uh huh. Yeah. The, the one on the left would be Monsieur Beaucaire, I assume. Uh huh. I saw it recently at the silent movie. I had Is never it seen it French? before. Very good print. Because it's supposed to be toned in blue and pink. Uh, this wasn't toned, but it Just was very good pump. quality. Yeah. And, the uh, original release. I enjoyed the film very much. I thought it was wonderful. And this is, this of course, I gave to the Cinematheque Francaise. It's my one big find. The billboard we read. Oh my god, how fabulous. Where did you find that? 
Uh, it was never been used. It was all folded up, and it was, the paper was very delicate. And they, they, they did all the linen back there. Can you imagine linen back at the billboard would be like from the corner of the room to here? You know, that's, it's, it's called a 24 sheet. That's a lot of paper, a lot of uh, backing, but they, they did it. It's one of their treasures. But I, I, you know, I gave it to them. I didn't. <coughs> I gave them an original script of Blind Husbands. To the cemetery? Yeah. So I hope it survived their periodic fires. Or their, or their periodic floods. Yeah, either one or the other. So. And I found it in the bottom of the box, and I had it for 15 years. Uh -huh. And I, uh -huh. I just kept thinking, what am I going to ever do with this? It's, it's fabulous, but, you know. Did it have any notes on it or anything? Didn't have, well... It had one little note, but I don't think it was a strong note. It uh -huh. was from the parent. I think parent was in the department. So. Well, I noticed that he had a very definite uh, handwriting. You know, so. <clears throat> well, let us proceed with whatever we're going to do. And the, the eclipse is only an hour away. Okay. But I think the sky is going to be overcast, unfortunately. Sure, it looks like it. Yeah, it's very overcast. Want to jump right in? Or do you? No, Paul. <laughs> Maybe I'd better bring over a Red Bull and just have it down here in case I feel like it. Have you discovered those yet? No, oh, I didn't. Oh, careful. They're loaded with caffeine. Oh, one of those Red Bulls. No, I've never had one. I don't, <laughs> but I don't. I avoid caffeine generally. Well, okay. Well, so, I mean, I think probably that's a good idea to, in the next like, hour or hour and a half, to just cover some of the time that you guys... They don't call it caffeine, they call it taurine. And yeah, it's made, made up of ground... It actually is made from ground-up bull testicles. <laughs> well, I guess they're honest, they call it That won't give you a charge nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stick my diet coke. <laughs> No, well, these things, all it does, it does give you a little lift. It's not a... But there used to be a, a, a famous dish in the Old West called Prairie Oysters. Sure. They still have them. That was bull's testicles. It's a delicacy. Or, yeah. or sheep testicles. Or, yeah, whatever, testicles. <laughs> and they're better when they're sliced. They're a little chewy. I've never had All right. <laughs> Rolling my along. What was your first question going to be? <laughs> It's just protein. I mean, there's every part of the animal, not as well. So. Well, I guess I, I was trying to say that I thought it would be the best use of our time to kind of finish up this segment with the two of you and go over some of the events and where your lives were came together. And I guess I had one follow-up question when you told the story um, last week about the Schindler House. And what yes. the reaction of Nurse and John Cage. Yes. Um, Kenneth doesn't seem to remember that quite in the same way that I do. What? That's not a. That I evening mean, at the Schindler House where we showed our film. Is that surprising? <laughs> it's, it's like in Proust or something where people remember things different ways. Oh, no, it's not surprising, but I'm just, sa I'm just making a statement. That's it's better impression. to remember different versions of the same thing than not to remember at all. <laughs> <laughs> like true. Proust. Poor Billy Dove. I said, what was it like to work when I lived in Palm Springs? I got to know her quite well because she was lonely and she did in this her husband had died and she was in this big old place. And so, you know, I was her escort for a while and did things, favors for her and so forth. And it was wonderful. She died. But I said, what was it like, Billy, to work with Japan's greatest kabuki art? artist. She says, I never worked with the Japanese. And I said, well, you've just forgotten. She said, well, I worked with Douglas Fairbanks. I worked with, and she, you know, go off. And I said, well, you also worked with Sojin, who's one of the greatest kabuki actors that came over, it was in uh, Thief of Baghdad and Fairbanks, and then many other Japanese films. And his face was so extraordinary. He looked like a Lon Chaney makeup 
as Dr. Wu only without makeup because his face was built that way. And, and so they didn't have to make him up like an oriental because that's the way he looked. And he had these tremendous cheekbones. I mean, he looked like a stylized Asian mask, you know, rather than, I mean, yeah, he had extraordinary. Yeah, so Jim, yes. Well, he, there was this movie that she made, a late silent, where he, he seduced her rather brutally. And, you know, and then this was, you know, it was one of these melodramas that ended up in blood and all kinds of stuff going on because this oriental had got to her. And so she just blanked the whole thing out of her memory. I don't remember ever doing a scene with an oriental. So, Kenneth, do you remember that story of showing your films at the Schindler House at all? But then I showed her the stills, and she said, well, that is me, and that's it. They said, oh, yes, yes, I remember. Then he gave me, he did a very, the reason I'd forgotten is he gave me a very rude thing. He gave her orchids. And within the orchids, there was a little oriental box, a Japanese, you know, little teak box of some kind. And she opened it, and there was this little figure inside, like a little smiling Buddha. And she turned it upside down. And when you turn it upside down, the genitals are exposed. You know, like it's sitting on a kimono, but then if you're looking up like through the glass floor, there's all its genitals right there. And that is a Japanese way of saying, I want to go to bed with you, to give one of these little dolls. But she found it very offensive, and so she never spoke to her again. Oh. And, and, but I said, do you have the doll? She found it for me. She said, there it is. Huh. And so... Um, where proof is it now? positive. Right. And where is it now? It's in my collection. Oh, I gave it to the Kinsey Institute. Uh-huh. Yeah. But they're actually quite common. It's, little, it's called love dolls. And yeah. they make them male and female, and often they're a couple. They look perfectly like sweet little chatkas, you know. But you turn them upside down, and they don't have any clothes on under their kimonos, you know. And, so and it's all quite explicit. Mm. Like, um, so, Kenneth, do you remember the Schindler House story at all that Curtis reiterated the other night? Outdoor showing? Yeah. Or screening? Well, or actually, the screening itself was in the living room, inside. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I remember the house. But this, it's, it's, it, this incident is indelibly in marked in my brain. It was, uh, we were invited to show Fireworks and Fragment of Seeking at the Schindler house. And Mrs. Schindler was the, spent the whole time of the screening in the kitchen preparing her tea table. So and she didn't see the films. She didn't see the films. <laughs> so that's too bad. And the reaction was very was one of shocked silence. Yes, well, that's like when I showed fireworks to Jean Kelly and his wife. She writes about it in that last book, oh, she Betsy did? Blair. I haven't read it. I wanted to read well, it. Well, she writes about, she, imagine remembering that I showed fireworks to her and uh, Jean way back in 1947, and she actually remembered and put it in her memoirs as if it was that important. Mm. And she said how she was embarrassed for me because Jean and his friends and her friends were, couldn't, didn't know what to say to me. They were like, uh, you know, like, they were like, <laughs> they, were <laughs> they were, I guess, shocked. Speechless. Or speechless, shocked, whatever. Yeah. And I never got invited back for a second time, <laughs> but I insisted that she pay me. And I said, now look, I, you know, I'm going to Beverly Hills High School, and I'm making my own movies, and I expect to get $25 for bringing the film over and show it. I mean, you know, you're rich people, and uh, you're working in the industry, and I have no money. And she said, of course. And she went to her purse and just gave me the money. But Gene never, he's a tight you know, Gene Kelly. He never, he would never have given me the money. Well, then I guess uh, Kenneth doesn't remember all of this about, you don't remember that you told me that um, after the screening, about a week or so later, you called me one day and you said, I, I had a call from Mrs. Schindler. And she said, we have been discussing you two boys, and we think you're both very sick young men. You don't remember telling me that? Frankly, no. Like we both should get a shrink? 
Yeah, well, like, you know, that was the attitude. Yes. These, are, these are films made by sick minds. Yes. Uh-huh. You know, that was... Right, but you see, the, but the other thing was that, that uh, you know, that this was showing before the creme de la creme of, of artists and intellectuals in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. including John Cage and Merce Cunningham. They were surprisingly uptight compared to probably what you would have found in New York at the same time. Or, and, uh, or in Europe. Well, in Europe, there's yeah. no question. But, I yeah. assume this content was, was referring, I mean, this comment was referring to the sexual content of the films? I mean, did you understand that to be the case? Well, yeah, yeah so that or, or the violence or whatever. Or the, or, or no, just it would the, be the sexual uh, content, I think. But, you know, they both could have been read like Freudian dreams, and, and all these people knew about Freud. Some of them were undergoing psychoanalysis, which was very popular back then. And I know we had a showing to, uh, at one point, to uh, of these films to a Jungian analyst, and he, he found them very interesting. Mm-hmm. He told me that my film was uh, about the anima, you know, the Jungian terminology which I didn't know at the time, but it was very interesting. But, uh, Can I ask the two of you to move in a little bit more? I'm sorry. Close to you, Just yes, a little bit. Thank I'm you. only sitting where you told me. I know that. I know that. <laughs> What's that? Kenneth keeps moving. Is that, a, is that recording or something? Yes. It's recording. Yeah. Oh, okay. Am I okay and then one of, Yeah, is that okay? Well, do you want to move in? Oh, all right. And I guess also... All you have to do is speak up. Okay. Just to follow up on something that we were talking about before. Is that okay now? Curtis had mentioned right. to us about the two of you had go, going up... What's that? To follow up, Curtis had told us a story about the two of you going up to San Francisco and meeting... When we met James uh, Broughton and... It's Frank Stoffick. Sidney S- Peterson and Frank Stoffick. And they had a showing at the museum, of, yeah. their museum of modern art. We made art. a special pilgrimage. Uh huh. Well, they were invited. I mean, we didn't go uninvited. I mean, we, had, <laughs> <laughs> we had some kind of exchange of letters that. Oh, came probably. Out. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Now you see, he remembers that. I don't remember that. I just. I mean, we just we didn't go up like here we are from Southern California. So did you screen because, your films at the museum at the yeah. cinema? Yeah. Sure, yes. yeah. And, and they had they'd had that. It wasn't like that was the first screening. They'd had it for a year or two going on in the post-war period. Right. They started and they considered themselves superior to Southern California. There was, they still feel that way. Yes, yes they do. I mean, <laughs> I San know. Franciscans still treat... I couldn't treat, disagree with them more, but there you are. They, they still... Um, there's still a certain a amount of... Ad, but there used to be much more of an attitude towards... Um, the, you know, looking down on Southern California, like that's where the, they make those movies and that kind of, you know, like Hollywood and like it's like low culture. Right, they Not, were and they were high crap, culture. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There, there was that little bit of whiff of that. They didn't mm-hmm. rub it in, but I mean that. With the opera company. Yeah. So did you spend time with Jim Broughton there and Sidney Peterson? Well, we got to know James quite well, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. right. They were friendly. They weren't. Um, I always thought James Broughton was a bit pretentious with his poetry and everything, but uh, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, being a little pretentious. I don't remember getting to know Sidney Peterson at all. I met him, but that's uh-huh. about all. Well, I loved his film called The Lead Shoes, which was a, par- a parody of The, the Red reaction. Shoes by my friend Michael Powell. It came out about the same time. <laughs> that's cute. I didn't realize that's what it was. Oh, yeah, that, that's the parody so of the title. Did you continue, how long did you continue your contact with Jim Brown? I mean, was it, did, I know you met him in this period. Did you continue your, your contacts and friendship? And well, it wasn't that close a friendship, but we, I think I went back to San Francisco more often than Curtis, at least on my own. Yeah, I, I think uh-huh. you did. Yeah, and I had people up there. The poet Robert Duncan uh-huh. is a close friend of mine, and Jess Collins, who is still alive. Duncan died, but they let me stay at their wonderful house in the Mission District, a Victorian house full of treasures. And so, you know, it made a big difference not have to pay for a hotel room or something. So I always had a place to stay. And uh, I love San Francisco. I lived there for a while in an old Victorian house on Fulton Street. And what did Jess and, and 
uh, and Doug, I think of your films. Well, they loved them, I guess. I mean, you know. Did they, I mean, they, they went to the screenings and so forth. Yeah. Only just as a recluse, he doesn't go out much. I, I, maybe I brought the projector to the house, I don't know. Uh -huh. He's still a recluse, which is rather difficult when you live alone. Because he's, he's now, must be in his 70s. And he's apparently quite, some of the other people in San Francisco told me that he, they're just terrified that it's going to burn down the house or something. It'll put, he, he cooks all his own meals. He's a very good cook, but he could put something on the stove and then forget about it or something and go back to painting because he, he works on paintings for 10 or 15 years per painting because they're all built up in layers of paint and everything. He's collected all over the world in his paintings because they're all thick layers of paint. I mean, and, and, and like he has a wonderful one of Mrs. Winchester of the Winchester Mystery House. That, mm. Oh, really? Yeah, That's and it took him about 15 years to paint it. Mm -hmm. And he gave it to me, and then I gave it back. I said, you keep it, because I'm traveling around and everything. It, you, it's still my painting, but I mean, I want you to keep it in your house. Cause it's very heavy, because it's only about this big. The paint is about six inches thick. And it never really hardens completely. You can actually push your finger in, oh, in the paint. Oh, very fragile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but over 100 years, it'll harden completely, you know because it's getting harder and harder all the time. The paint, this is very good oil paint from France. And it gets a skin on the top, and then it gradually right. hardens and hardens. So why don't you tell us, both of you, tell us a bit about art and cinema and how you interacted with that, because I've seen that they screen both Fragment of Seeking and Escape episode, at least they're listed in the program. Well, yes, right? they did. I think I only had one print. I may have had two prints, but I... I know uh, there's that little lab on uh, Sunset near Columbia, or what used to be Columbia. It's now called the Gower Studios, at Hollywood Film Enterprises. Mm -hmm. I used to get my prints made there, and I could only afford one at a time. And I think finally, I didn't, when I went to Europe, my negatives were left there, and it was 16 millimeter negative. And I don't, I think I maybe owed them a few, like $75 or something. I mean, not a huge amount of money, but I would probably owe them something. And I think after a year, they had the right to throw, throw my stuff away, and they did. Because when you leave things in a lab, it's A-Y-O-R, at your own risk. Exactly. Every, every lab has that clause. In other words, if there's a fire or some disaster or it gets lost, that's your own risk. If you're going to leave it here, we'll be happy to accommodate it as long as we're printing it occasionally. But you just can't leave it there for 10 years with no prints. I mean, I mean, they want to continue the working relationship. So how, who but, contacted you from Martin Center? What? Who contacted I'm you? I'm sorry, from? I'm a bit deaf, and the sorry, echo in this room is kind of... I'll be louder. No. Uh, who, who contacted you from Martin Cinema, and how did that whole, whole relationship start? I mean, was it Frank um, Stauffacher, or was it... Someone else up there? No, I'm pretty sure it was Frank Stauffacher. Uh -huh. was, did Harry Smith come down to Los Angeles and look at the films initially? He was he was scouting for art and cinema and came uh, down here. Well, yes, I remember meeting him uh, at some point back then, but you know I don't remember. It never developed into a really close relationship, and I didn't see him that much. He tells the story of coming to your mother's home and breaking that you know, sitting down and watching fireworks, and he broke a, a an expensive chair. Oh, he sat in, in one of my grandmother's antique chairs and broke it. Yeah, I remember that. Not a, not didn't go over well with my grandmother. <laughs> but it was a very fragile. He shouldn't. Have, he, there were other chairs. He chose the most delicate-looking chair and, and sort of crunched down and it broke. <laughs> Well, okay, let me ask you a little bit then about Puce Moment, since Mr. Harrington worked for you on that film briefly. And he did, uh, I filmed the ballet of the... Costumes? Costumes, well, they're actually robes. They're not, I mean, they're uh, 20s gowns mm -hmm. in his little apartment. In Curtis's apartment? Yeah. Uh -huh. And it was, uh, I put them on a rack, like a, which was a broom handle or something, and put them one That's after the other. That's the way the film began. Yeah. And then we just made one take of it. We didn't make two. 
and uh, Curtis filmed it, and then I was manipulating, because she's looking for the Proust gown, so uh -huh. Yvonne was, so uh, taking one off, I mean, that one, she keeps take, looking and, you know, like dancing in them, and, and they dance around, and then she, the next one and the next one, and finally she comes to the Proust one, which is solid green and purple sequins. The Proust color, you turn them, it's iridescent like a beetle's back. That's why or a Proust is a flea. I mean, that insects, you look at them one way and they're green, another way they're purple, you know. It's a certain kind of, in, and this was a popular color in the 20s. It was called Proust. And um, it, iridescent, it's, it's both purple and green, because depending on how you look at it and the turns of the light, it's a wonderful. Did, did Curtis, Curtis, did you also shoot the other parts of the film? Or was that I the didn't shoot, uh, I didn't shoot any of the exteriors, just uh, in that room. I just think I shot a few of the shots of her by the mirror, or putting, putting on the... Uh, that, was in, that was in Samson's yeah, living room, Samson. in the front house, not uh, the back house. And the film was so slow at that time that Kodachrome was about ASA 25 or something, mm -hmm. that I only had a couple of photo floods, uh, and the only way to film it was to film at eight frames a second, and so I figured out that this will look like a silent film to have her move very slowly and to film it at eight frames a second. And so it created this whole stylized look, which was out of necessity, because otherwise I couldn't have photographed at all because there wasn't enough light. Mm -hmm. And there was no way to bring in more light at that time because uh, uh, the house wires would only take so much and, and uh, or else. But as it turned out, it uh, greatly enhances the effect. Yes, of course, but it's like one of those happy accidents. It's completely it's, it, it cre I mean, stylized. It creates, yeah, stylizes yeah, the yeah, action. Uh -huh. just yeah, no, it actually works for me. And there was so little film. I mean, I never, I think I did the whole film on one take each. I certainly didn't have any leftovers oh. like I hear and about. As like, I said, all I did was press the button. I mean, Kenneth <laughs> did everything. I mean, he put the lights and he. Stage well, I was grateful to have know. that that help because I could. You know, just a, and they, but what I mean is I don't say, oh, I'm the cinematographer of this film because I, I wouldn't consider it being that. I was his assistant, really. That's what I was. Let me let me ask you both a more general question because, and this is something that I've been very interested in for a long time, which is your relation to silent film. Now, you're both too old to have experienced the death of the silent cinema immediately as it happened, and yet so much of your work and so much of what you talk about is informed by the silent cinema. And I'd like to know a little bit more about how you came to silent cinema, how you saw it, um, how it became important to you, and, and that sort of thing, because you're sort of one of the first generations of people who actually had a historical film consciousness, who didn't live through the actual historical periods of the cinema, but look, look back on the cinema and, and have used that in your work. And I, I see that as a very important part that's informing the way that you made films. So I, I would like to ask the question about how you came to know, I mean, and also you're both so knowledgeable about silent cinema, you could both be curators or film historians anywhere in the world. Um, so how did you encounter it first and come to well, know I it so well? we have completely separate stories on that account, so... You Go ahead start. with yours. <laughs> okay. Uh, I came to it through reading. I, I mentioned this to you before, that when I was in high school, I discovered in the library, uh, I mean early on, like the age of 13 or something, I discovered this book called The Film Till Now by Paul Rotha, which is a, a world history of the cinema up until the, the beginning of talkies. And it... it I was reading about all these films. You know, he has, he has a couple of, couple of cha chapters on the American cinema. Uh, that's tricky. That's Sorry. Yeah. A couple of chapters on the American cinema, and, uh, you know, he has a chapter on the French cinema, the German cinema, the Russian cinema, and so on. And uh, I, I read that, and... Um, Reading about it inspired my, uh, stimulated my imagination. So when I finally went to college, I went to Occidental College directly from high school at the age of 16, because it was during the war, so there was this big accelerated program 
and I went to high school directly. I mean, I went to uh, a college directly from high school at the age of 16. And then I remember reading about this uh, film society that, in Hollywood that was starting. And, uh, and I made an inquiry about it somehow. And I used to go on a, a bus or a, a streetcar or whatever, because I didn't, certainly didn't have a car, all the way from Eagle Rock to Hollywood to see this was the beginning. So I, up until that point, I hadn't seen any silent films. <laughs> So then I began to see them. I mean, she was, and they were, what she was showing were whatever was available in, on these series of programs from the Museum of Modern Art in New York, curated by Iris Berry. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you could look up what films were available, some of the key D.W. Griffith films, and, uh, and certainly some Russian films. And uh, so, uh, uh, that's how I began to see some of these films. And then the added thing was that Clara Grossman, who showed these films at her art gallery, and that's where I originally met Kenneth, we were both going there, um, that uh, she, uh, she was able to have uh, as many people involved with these films as could be found in Hollywood at the time. So... I, I remember particularly an occasion when I saw, for the first time, Broken Blossoms, and Mr. Griffith was there, and Miss Gish were there. Wow. So that was the kind of thing. So that's, as far as I can tell you, that is my whole orientation towards silent films and how I began to get to see some of the, the important silent films when I was still a teenager, 17, 18, you see. And, and did you feel at that time, or did you have a feeling that time about how different silent films were from? You were going already to the mainstream cinema, the sound Well, cinema, naturally, of I mean, course. just whatever movies were. Anything playing. that had Marlene Dietrich in it. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh -huh. So uh, I just, you but, know, the sense of the difference of that other cinema <clears throat> is interesting to me, and the, the, the idea that. She would have shown, and uh, speaking of Sternberg's work, which interests she would have probably shown uh, I probably saw Underworld there mm -hmm. and um, uh, one of his other silent films uh, would have been seen there mm -hmm. but I didn't see uh, his talking films until later, quite a bit later I wasn't able to see them um, and uh, so uh, uh, you asked me about the difference. Um, I never thought of them that way. I mean, I just thought they were films without sound was all. They were still, you know, they were visually, uh, sometimes visually wonderful. I got to see The Last Laugh, mm -hmm. you know, which was the, the film we all read about, certainly in Paul Rosa, that it was the first film without subtitles mm -hmm. in the silent era and it told the whole story visually without any subtitles and with the, and the whole thing about the moving camera, the fluidity of the moving camera. Uh, all that's part of the repertory of sound films too. So I didn't, I just looked at it as what in point of fact it was, was a technological problem. They didn't have the ability to put sound in. You know, so when I read the Sternberg, uh, when sound films arrived, welcomed the opportunity no longer to be at the mercy of some pianist in a small town or some organist in a theater for the musical accompaniment and maybe sticking in a few sound effects, that he could control everything. That was an attitude I totally shared, you know, that uh, so uh, I. It, it just and I was I was aware, but again, I saw I was seeing films in the 40s and 50s. You see, so that they were fluid and everything. I didn't ever go through the early talking period where they had the cameras in these big booths and they just were very. Uh, there was suddenly all of the mo beautiful moving camera work of the silent era stopped for a while. Only for a few years. But only yeah, 
And, and the directors devise ways of getting around that very quickly, or they do a silent sequence and add the sound or something. So you experience the silent cinema and sound cinema as a kind of a continuity, like styles of literature, maybe, rather yes. than as a big, as an abrupt break. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. That was my attitude toward it. I I don't remember ever being. It, it was just film, you know. It was just film. It just lacked sound. That's all. Well, it didn't lack sound at Clara's because she had a pianist and she had an upright right. piano. No, but I meant, I meant the films were. <laughs> and he was quite good at, at playing with yeah. them. You know, he yeah. didn't. He didn't. No, I just meant he, that they had they were, subtitles. Uh, and he had experience playing in silent movies. That mm-hmm. old guy, and and he, you know, she paid him about a two dollars a film or something. You know, I mean, he was practically doing it for nothing. He enjoyed it, but you know, she never ran them. Uh, ran them completely silent. No, I didn't there was mean a, silence. Oh, there was an old piano Nobody there. Ever it, was, it was always accompanied, and sometimes, you know, like for Potemkin, he would really cut loose. You know, it's some kind of Russian, uh, very kind of thunderous, uh, incredible, revolutionary-sounding music. And being she being very leftist, you know, that I really got a lesson in silent Russian cinema. I mean, we saw Kudovkin as Eisenstein and uh, Alexander Room, Bed and Sofa. I remember she showed that. Uh, that was a, a heavy part of her agenda, to show those uh, early Soviet silent films. Well, we, we were lucky to, to see them. Beautiful 16 millimeter prints in black and white that they don't know how to make anymore because the labs are gone. I mean, very good Contrasts of blacks and whites and grays and, and uh, the great range of tones, but it's it's and, a lost art, you know. Yeah. I mean, the prints. And then I remember the showing of uh, uh, of one of the great silent films, which is uh, Joan Joan of Arc. The, I mean, uh, the Passion of the Joan. Passion of Joan of Arc, the Dreyer film, you know. And I'll never forget get uh, somebody got up in the, the, a lot of. Critics at the time said, you know, but there's no movement in this film. It was, you know, it was just a series of close-ups of the dialogues. With dialogue titles. Yeah. Long dialogue yeah, titles. That, that it was like a talking film transcript. with titles during the talking. It was the transcript. But it was the absolutely time. gorgeous. I mean, it, you know, this was such but a... But what I, what I wanted to say that I remember was, to me, it was a wonderful comment that someone there was saying, you know, but, you know, the film doesn't move, and it's a, they were being very critical of it or something. And I remember somebody just got up and said, well, it moved me, and walked out. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's one of the most emotionally moving films ever made. And with that Falconetti, the only thing she ever did on, st- on in front of a camera, because she was apparently a stage yeah. performer. yeah. And she shaved her head for the film. Have you seen it? Yes. Okay. Many times. Stan Brackett used to show it in his class. It's powerful. Film it's powerful film. And of course, I love Dreyer, and I love him. You know, the, the vampire film he made, Vampire, yeah. is one of my favorites. Did people, after, at the Clara Grossman's gallery, did people hang around after the films and talk about them? Oh, and, yeah. Yes, it was tiny, right. like it was an audience of 25 people. It could just barely fit a few chairs in there, folding That's chairs. A tiny gallery. And then it was so tiny that the projector had to be outside under the palm tree. And it was projected, it had sort of a sliding glass thing, and that was slid aside so it could be projected. And the projector was loaned by the Department of Cinema, Professor Moore at USC, and it had to be brought over every, like, Friday night or, or, or the weekend, what it was. In other words, she didn't own a projector. She didn't have enough money to buy one. And it was very kind of the, of the USC. Oh, yeah, I know that absolutely to be true. Uh, like, like, once I had to go pick it up in a taxi or something. Uh, and um, Professor Moore would come now and then, too. He was a very kind man. He, he let me use lights and things for fireworks. Um, go ahead, Kurt. Oh, well, so, so that, that, but that answers your question, I think. Uh, yeah. You know, more questions? <laughs> Curtis, did you, I mean, Kenneth, did you want to respond to the question? What question? Well, I was asking a little bit, I mean, a little bit generally about how 
you came to discover the silent cinema, and of course Curtis has answered some of that. But also, well, he answered it for himself. I answered it for myself. My God, story is totally God. different. Yeah. Excuse me, yes. Listen to and, his story. Yes, and uh, perhaps he could fill us in a little bit on your experience. I remember when, I, when we went to Bologna the first year that we went together, you knew every film better than any of the, any of the curators that were there and, and, and all of the other films around it. So tell us a little bit about how you came to silent film and, how, and, and came to know so much about it. Well, I had a very indulgent grandmother who was a portrait painter. She was president of Women Painters of the West, which was plein air painting in early California. That means you took your easel and canvas out into the landscape and painted from the real thing. Like her, her, She went to Palm Springs in, this, in um, April when the sand dunes were covered with desert verdina, which is this brilliant purple fluorescent color, and painted those. And then we went up to near Bakersfield for the wild, uh, wildflower season and painted there from the real thing. I mean, you know, this was the way plein air paints, painting is done. And I would go along, and sometimes I'd have to hold the easel so it wouldn't blow over, you know, and things like that. And it was great. I just, it was, and it got me turned on to color very early. I mean, to see the psychedelic uh, colors of the poppies and purple lupin, and all, you know, incredible colors. And then she would capture all that, on, you know, on, with paint and bring it home. And so, but... Early on, I had an interest in movies, and it was never like, you're too young to be taken to see a movie. You'll get restless and you'll... Well, she took me to see at Raman's Chinese Theater. I don't know how, I must have seen an ad for it in the paper, but I said, I have to see this. I have to see it. And she, she took me, and I was like a toddler, I was really small to see at Grandma's Chinese Theater the first week, it wasn't the premiere, but, but though we did go to a few of those, the first week of Noah's Ark of Curtis in the production that drowned 12 extras. I mean, you know, it mur he murdered 12 extras making the film. Well, he didn't personally kill them, but I mean, they got drowned. It was an accident, but you know. And there's a picture of the corpses wrapped up in sheets laying outside the soundstage, which is a suppressed Warner Brothers history for a photograph. But at any rate, <laughs> it was a sound film, but it really was a silent film with music I mean, and sound effects. And during the flood, the screen expanded on magnoscope, so it became twice as big. <laughs> and I got so... Excited! I mean, I felt like water was coming into the theater, and I started running up and down the aisle, starting to pound around, running like to escape the water. But then I'd come back in the front and run around again. And she didn't stop me. She let me do it. You know, I mean, she let me. Somebody else would have gotten grabbed me and put me. But then I came back and sat down. <clears throat> so, but before that, we'd gone to Chicago what was called the Chautauqua screenings in Pacific Palisades, which are outdoor screenings during the summer. Chautauqua is a thing that goes back to the 19th century. There were cultural events that were sort of tied in with Christian churches, in a, but not blatantly, sponsoring le uh, lectures by famous people and, and uh, that sort of thing. And uh, there were Chautauqua screenings and the first screening she took me to was a very strange double bill. The first one was Jackie Coogan in, now what was, uh, it was one of the later, the second uh, Jolson, it wasn't the first Jolson, it was like, it, it's the one where that's, there's a song about Sunny Boy, mm -hmm. sit upon my knee, Sunny Boy, but, that, but it's yeah. called The Singing Fool, I think. Singing S fool. Yeah, sit upon my knee, Sunny Boy, and all that. The Singing Fool. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. And it was with Vitaphone Disc. 
because she took me back to the projection room, and there was this great big disc, like a huge pizza plate, you know. And I said, wow. So I knew that it, even a little kid, that it was all illusion, that it was, it came out of that record. We had records at home, you know. I mean, we had, you know, like uh, classical 12 inch uh, shellac records and things. <laughs> So I, I knew what a record was, and I knew that if you sat on it, it broke, you know, because I did that a few times. <laughs> but um, so the double, it was the strangest double bill. The first film was The Singing Fool, with, uh, it was Sunny Boy. The second one was Thunder Over Mexico, The Soul Lesser. And my grandmother thought it was a travelogue about Mexico, and she loved Mexico and had been there several times. In fact, the last trip killed her because she got dysentery down there and she never recovered and then died uh, shortly, you know, when she came back here. But I mean, she, she got a stomach thing. It was very easy to get that down there, probably today too. It's called Montezuma's Revenge. But at um, <clears throat> any rate, Sunny Boy had a glitch, had a, a projection mistake or glitch that the um, Vitaphone disc stuck, and it, it kept saying, Sonny, hick, Sonny, hick, Sonny, hick. And I thought it was just so magical and wonderful. You know? <laughs> I loved it. A surrealist. Yes, yeah, abso absolutely. And uh, then they had to close it down, and it took about 20 minutes to get on again, you know. And, and playing those Vitaphone discs was a real hassle. No wonder it didn't last too long. But it lasted up to then. In fact, the last Vitaphone discs were still issued with Warner Brothers Pictures in 1933. Even some of those Busby Berkeley musicals were also issued on Vitaphone. And of course, their logo, uh, Vitaphone Presents or Vitaphone, you know, Warner Brothers Vitaphone with that sort of pennant flag with the lettering, lasted quite a while. But, um, I mean, the sound was wonderful quality. But I became very interested in uh, movies, and my grandmother rented from a Beverly Hills photo shop um, Kodak miniature versions of silent films for children that were shortened versions of classics that you, it cost about a dollar to rent one for the weekend. Or, you know, it was very cheap. I mean, well, naturally, the money you can't compare with today. but. Um, and they came in little cans, and it was 16 millimeter. It wasn't uh, eight; it was before eight millimeter. And I saw, and they were called photoscopes, something like that. Co I mean, the name Kodak was in there, and they were all black and white, of course, and silent. And we had a, a home projector. You know, it wasn't a sound projector; it was a silent projector. But you know, it would take those reels, 400 foot reels, and there was a condensed version of Rin Tin Tin in, um, well, the Law of the North or whatever, you know, I mean, several. And I just loved that dog. And so the first films I ever saw were Rin Tin Tin Silence, projected completely silent, mm -hmm. only when the dog would bark, I would then go, rah, rah. You see, I, it would bark, it, but of course it was silent, but I would supply the sound effect. I said, you know, and, uh, and then my grandmother used to do this about every weekend, because she, she saw that I liked them, and she liked them too. She'd seen them before. And there was a little bit of, of um, Buster Keaton, a little bit of Chaplin, a little bit, there were little tastes of things, you know. And of course, I realized from seeing some of them in complete form later that it was sort of a, like a desecration to make these shortened versions. And one was an incredible, uh, some kind of biblical spectacle that had been shortened to, to uh, half an hour. <laughs> that I can't, and it had Greta Nissen in it. I remember that actress. And I could, you know, remember the title if I looked up her filmography. But and that was the first thing I saw was some sort of semi-naked people in it. And, and Grandma didn't say anything because she, she'd taken to me to museums where art nudes, you know, mostly female, but, you know, that was the big thing. I mean, 
uh, in, in classical art to have uh, uh, naked ladies in an artistic pose. You know, it was nothing uh, sexual about it. It was just art. The body is art. And so um, I became very interested in these little silent films. And I th then we had a 16 millimeter Cine Kodak 100, lo 100 foot load spring wind home movie camera that we only used for vacations, occasionally for a birthday party or the typical what families used to do. Take it, we took it to Yosemite. Mm -hmm. and, and then one summer, we came back from Yosemite, and there were four reels left over, four roll, hundred foot rolls left over, black and white. And I looked out, the ex, I could read by then, I looked at the expiration date, and it said, use before September 1938, or something like that. <laughs> and I said, well, look, this film is going to go bad, uh, and you got, it won't last till next summer, so let me make a little something with it. My grandmother said, yes, you can. She never said no to me, except when I came home after 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> See, she got very nervous when I started to be like 13, 14, 15, sitting on the porch with the light on, and she'd be in her rocking chair. This was at her Hollywood house. And I'd go out and want to see a double bill or something and maybe talk to a few people. And I was growing up a teenager. I mean, I didn't feel like I had to stay home all the time. But if I arrived home after 10, she was on the porch. Her name was Bertha, German, you know, mm -hmm. Big Bertha, I called her. Practically in tears, because she imagined in her paranoid brain all these things that were happening to me, which very well could have, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. You know, I was perfectly safe. But she, you know, I mean, like 10 o'clock, it was like the stroke of midnight, and, you know, the, and the coach would turn into a pumpkin or something. And then I, I was like 14, and she embraced me on the porch like, Oh, you're home alive, you know, like you hadn't been cut up in pieces and, they, and they'd come with your pieces in a box to be identified. And I said, you've got to stop this, Grandma, because I'm growing up. I'm no longer your little baby. So, but she never would, you see. I mean, she, uh, and so finally I had to sort of like break loose from her. And, you know, it was sort of, but, you know, that's the only way you can do because Because she raised me because my... Um, I was a birth control accident. My big sister told me that hated me, and she said, we never wanted you anyway. Uh, she's 10 years older than me, and she said, you were the birth control accident. And uh, <clears throat> my brother and sister both hated me, because I wasn't even supposed to be there. I was the birth, my mother was 40 when I was born, you know, and you're not supposed to have babies that late in life, at least then. <clears throat> so um, my grandmother raised me, and I was like her child, you see. And my grandmother's, we got along well. We were both sort of artists, you know. And uh, when I said I refused to do sports in school, she said, well, that's going to make life difficult for you. I said, I don't care. I will not waste my time doing that stupid team stuff. I just hate every second of it. I won't do it. And she said, well, you're cutting a rough road for yourself. And I said, okay, it's my road. And she says, okay, that's what you see. So she would sign this note that I was, she lied for me, that I was subject to nosebleeds, <laughs> and that I shouldn't play any team sports or anything because I might have a nosebleed and they're very hard to stop. It was a complete lie. And so I would always read these one movie magazines and think I'd be sitting watching the other boys play and reading my movie magazines while they were. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us what you did with that camera when you got your hands on it and those four rolls. Well, I made, it only had 16 frames a second, the first camera, it didn't have any 24. So the first ones, like um, the love, um, let's see, which uh, some of the title, Who Has Been Rocking My Dream Boat? It was done to Bill's Brothers record. And I always had the music in mind when I made them. See, they were never like conceived as silent silence. Mm -hmm. But they only ran at 16 frames a second, so I had to play the record, a 10-inch record of the Mills Brothers. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then put the camera, put the projector on, and then start it, drop the needle when it started. Sort and of it, like it more or less that. worked out okay. But I, I couldn't ever transpose them to 24 frames a second. You'd have to do skip printing or something. To, and that was, to, or you could do it now you on video. Today, you could do it on video. Yeah. But anyway, the films are lost. So. That was true of my uh, 
shot, first version of Fall of the House of Usher was shot 16, 16 frames a second. But it was shot in 8mm, uh -huh. which is even worse, and, and on very, very bad film stock because it was made in the 40s. In the, was, during the war years. There, right? Yeah, during the war years. And, and there, there was, you couldn't get a Kodak film. I mean, you'd get, I'd, I'd send to some mail order house to get some terrible, oddball brand of film. Uh -huh. That was just of a terrible quality. Because there was, it was all like uh, rationed and everything. You know, there. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't find. A, just go into a photo shop, and there'd be a whole stack of film there waiting for you to pick out what you wanted. And when I was at this uh, film, the only time I've shown this film in recent years, was they, they begged me to show it at the uh, Munich Film Festival uh, two years ago. So. Um, I said, I will only show it if you can sh run it at 16 frames per second. And if I, if I can have my my own uh, accompaniment of music, a record. Mm -hmm. And I had a special uh, CD made. A friend of mine did me a CD of two selections of music that I, you know, I worked out with. And he, and, and he was able to put in some sound effects of thunder that enhanced it. And then I had to be in the booth they ran it at 16 frames, and I was the one who synchronized when the music would start. Mm -hmm. And that's the only screening there has been in, you know, was that but if, the if you, Curtis, if you wanted to, you could have that whole thing transcribed onto videotape. I know. At, at, and turn it from into 24, that you could I, I realize that. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, that this was a theater, and they wanted to show yeah. it that way. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not really... Uh, interested in pursuing that. I mean, it's, it, to me, it's academic, you know, it's an academic exercise to see what I did when I was 14 years old. Well, it's interesting that you were sort of, in a certain way, although you went to film school later on, sort of self-taught. I mean, you began with your own... Well, so it was kind of, I mean, uh, we, we, you know, I got my parents to buy me a little 8-millimeter camera. And well, I was, said, you know, I was too snobbish. Being See, from Beverly Hills, he, he wouldn't have anything to do with eight millimeters. I called, I called sixteen, I called eight millimeters spaghetti, uh, and, and it was like, spaghetti. It yes. was impossible. You couldn't edit it. You couldn't slice it. It was so tiny. But every slice was like a seismic earthquake going by. <laughs> the slice was about it's six times wide. Terrible medium, but anyway. Well, now they they have something called Super Eight. I don't know what's super about it. It's still eight millimeter. Maybe we can jump forward to when you guys were in Europe together, because I know, Kenneth, you went there first, and then Curtis came. I came over later. But afterwards, but to Paris. maybe you can talk about I, I went over in April of 1950, and I was met at the boat in Le Havre by um, two Frenchmen. One is a film critic named Adu Kiru that I later learned to detest, and he died. He's luckily dead because he, he was like a very pretentious film critic. And the other one was a French film kind of crazy nutcase called Jean Boulet that had his own film magazine called Sans Cinema de, de Pre after Saint Germain de Pre. And he wanted to sort of copyright me when I arrived and, and like. Any place that I went, he wanted to accompany me, like this is my trophy or something. And I got tired of, of that after the first week. And I said, I practically told him to get lost, you know, I got. And so then he became an enemy, which was okay with me. I mean, you know, I mean, anyone that wants to put me on a leash, they're going to have a hard time. But um, I'm very pleased that my grandmother paid my way to just one way, not return. On, uh, I went over on the De Grasse on the French line, wonderful food. Took about a week to get from New York to Le Havre. And Paris at that time was just wonderful. You know, it still felt like the war just ended. There were fresh bullet marks sprayed all over some streets where it was chipped off where they'd had some kind of fight. Fresh bronze plaques, the martyr died here, you know. And I was very lucky to be more or less adopted by Henri Langlois and um, Mary Merson, and it lasted for 12 years consistently, and it never ended, another, right up to their deaths. 
And luckily, you know, I, I knew what I was going to do. I studied French in Beverly Hills High School. I was an A student. The only thing I really got an A in, you know, I was really applied myself. And I could speak and think in French when I arrived. I wasn't like stumbling around like some stupid tourist with a little book, you know, La Russe or something like that. I mean, I still I mean, I talked like a yank, I guess. I mean, though I tried to lose it as much as I could. But luckily th that happened because like when I met Jean Genet and Cocteau the first year, none of those people would speak English, even though Cocteau probably understood. But he would never say one word in English. If the French elite considered there's only one language in the world, every other language is a mistake, like a degenerate mistake, that language is French. It can express everything perfectly. And if you don't, no French and think in French. You have to think in French as well as speak it. You really aren't worth wasting their time on. And I began to think in French. I mean, it became quite easy for me to switch over. I should have learned much earlier, because the earlier you learn, learn languages, the easier it is. And I had a wonderful sort of teacher, in a sense. Mary Mearson spoke like seven or eight languages, including Finnish, Russian, Estonian, I mean, she was a miracle for, and she could speak with all these guests at the Cinematheque like she'd spoken that language all her life, and she, it was just a natural gift. Mm -hmm. You know, some, yeah, some people have it, and she could speak perfect German. Yeah. Amazing. And perfect English. Oh, perfect English, too, of course. So, were you showing your films, were you showing fireworks at Peace Moment in, in Paris? Of course, at the Cinematheque. And, uh, did you show it also other places of Europe in Europe? Yeah, I began being invited to various festivals around. Uh, I went to the, sh felt the short film festival in uh, <coughs> Germany, I guess. I, I mean, they've asked me back. Uh, I forgot the name of the town. It was some little industrial town but where they'd been having a short film festival for the last 50 years. This is the 50th anniversary. And it's in kind of a, you know, the kind of town that has smokestacks. And I don't know if they still do, but it was like a steel town or something. Oberhausen, I think, something like that. And uh, I, I traveled around um, France. I went to see the surrealist construction called the uh, Factor Cheval, and this postman that made this incredible fairy palace out of stones he picked up. I went to there and, and um, met a lot of people that were, like I, when I lived on the Ile Saint Louis, when I got a little maid's room of my own, a maid's room on the seventh floor, the rent was like maybe $17 a month. But no heat. And believe me, it was not easy in the winter. But basically, I wanted to have it, even though I, I permanently had a guest room with the uh, uh, Mary Merson and Langua over on uh, <coughs> Rue Gazan, which was on the Parc Monceau. But um, that's where I got to know Robert Bresson quite well, because he lived on the Ile Saint Louis too, which is the island just behind Notre Dame, in the middle of the river, the Seine. And I found out that he would walk his dog every morning at six. And so I would, I didn't, was, wasn't like, you know, like a stalker, but I would be happy to walk him too, and I wouldn't. And after he'd seen me about 10 or 20 times, he would nod to me and I'd nod to him. And then, you know, a dog is a wonderful icebreaker for, uh, to say, I said, what a cute dog or something. Or, or, you know, you must love that dog a lot or something. I don't know why. Anyway, we began to talk, and then he realized that I worked at the Cinematheque, and then we would have these wonderful conversations. Not every, maybe once or twice a month. You know, it wasn't like I was doing it every morning. But, and he would accept me to accompany him on these early morning walks. And... I never told him, you know, you're my biggest idol or I, nothing stupid like that, you know. But I, he knew that I knew his films. I loved Les Dames de Bois de Boulogne, you know, the one with... Um, Caceres. Hmm? Caceres. Yeah, Maria yeah. Caceres, and, uh, who is a wonderful actress. Paul Bernard. Yeah. I, I remember, I saw it recently again. Yeah, it holds up, yeah. Oh, it's wonderful. Yeah. It's, it's a masterpiece. Uh -huh.
And it was made during the occupation, you know, with no lights, no money, uh, where they were freezing cold in the studio. It doesn't matter if you have a good idea. So what, what were some of the things that you did together? You mentioned seeing a performance of Cocteau and Stravinsky. Well, we, we went to the the theater of the Champs-Élysées to see the Stravinsky. He did well. Yeah. He did this Rex. Oedipus Rex. He took me to it. With uh, Stravinsky conducting and Cocteau doing the reading on stage. Now, Cocteau was in his 60s at the time. And he, um, he, he loved the spotlight, but he didn't know when to, he was overdoing it. And he came on in an outrageous, you know, everyone else was dressed in a tux or something, but you know, smoking, what they call smoking. He came on with an outrageously queeny, fluffy and gorgeous black sweater, you know, the kind that, it, that is look, that is, is all fluffy and everything. And then, the, you know, the rest was like a tuxedo, you know, the pants. Are. And Stravinsky in the orchestra pit looked up and saw that sweater, and you could see, see him just sort of freeze, you know. <laughs> like, and then he did the cocktail. You know, if someone had said, put down those glasses, because he took off his glasses. He was reading his own text that he knew by heart anyway. And then he took his glasses, and he was swinging them like this, you know, like a few times, not all the time, but, you know. And every time he swung the glasses, you could see Stravinsky just flinch, you know, until, oh, God. Like, you know, like it was just... And Alice B. Toklas was in the audience. I mean, she was going out, you know. I think Alice, I think uh, Gertrude had already died. But, and, you know, there were wonderful people that, that were still around then. And I was always remarked, I wonder if she, if Alice combed her mustache before she came out, because she had a pronounced mustache that she was proud of, I guess. Otherwise, I don't know why she didn't shave it off. But, um, <clears throat> And the reception at this performance was less than positive, is that correct? Oh, it was a great triumph. No, no, I mean, uh, the Oedipus Rex? No, it was okay, but Cocteau, uh, for people that cared about him and saw, you know, he was, he was a little bit hammy, you know, he was like hogging. I mean, here were two great stars, Stravinsky and Cocteau. And Stravinsky was in the orchestra pit. You saw the back of his head, which was bald, more or less. And Cocteau was on stage under the spotlight in this flouncy Angora sweater and swinging his glasses around. So, I mean, you know, it was an odd meeting of, of uh, geniuses. Uh, uh, Ken, do you remember, though, that uh, Cocteau had a tableau vivant above the orchestra? Yes. With the masks. And oh, yeah, it, it was... Um, it was a big production. It was a big production with mask costumes and, like, dance, and, you know, they would... It, but they were, like, frozen in space and, and these huge masks. And, and all those are probably in storage. Larger I mean. than life size. Yeah, masks. they wouldn't throw them away. It's very they, audacious. They've got to be stored probably in the theater museum or maybe Cocteau's own museum. He, he was very... Everything that he did, he was saving everything. He, he, he had a sense of history about himself. <laughs> but um, we, were, we were lucky to get to know him. Now, I taught him how to use a 16-millimeter camera because he'd never worked with 16-millimeter, and Kodachrome was just coming in. And he said he wanted to make this little film. And he said making a film should be as simple as picking up a pencil and just writing on paper, you know. Uh, uh, and of course now with video it really is it doesn't mean you can make good films just with things being so simple but the technique is quite simple now <clears throat> so he uh, his patron who was the Madame Schell uh, Madame Weisweiler who was a manicurist that married Mr. Schell Weisweiler of Shell Oil France they had this huge villa down on the Cap d'Antibes, and they built Cocteau a big studio in their garden. And he said, I'm like the pet rhinoceros, because 
they were paying for everything. He was living there with Edward. That's Jerry. where he did the, the chapel with his. Yes, drawings. well, later on, yes, it hadn't been. But he designed all. He painted their inside. All their rooms are painted by Cocteau. It must be still there. I don't know who lives in it now, but they certainly wouldn't paint out Cocteau's murals unless they're idiots. But um, can we just back up for the performance with the Stravinsky? Am I, was there a story that the audience reacted rather well, negatively? No, that was in 1913. No, but that was... No, I, I that, remember... That was there, for... Uh, no, but I remember at this performance we're talking about, Kenneth, that at a certain point there was a faction in the audience that began to boo. And, oh, yes, it's the people that hated it. And, 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 and what I remember is that, that Cocteau stood there with incredible dignity and then all the people that loved Cocteau were shushing the other people. Yes, but he was, loved that. He loved to be controversial. It was the same. I mean, I mean, it was the same theater where the Rite of Spring was, was right. played in 1913 with that riot. So this is a whole tradition in, 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 in Europe, and particularly in France, of having premieres with factions fighting each other. And right, everything. and the audience. This is something you never see in America. No, America's too blasé to, to ever get into but, that. But that passion is wonderful. Uh -huh. It's just wonderful. No, it keeps and then, but, but as I remember, so then finally, Cocteau stood there with such dignity, and then the noise died down, and he gave a speech, something to the effect that Mr. Stravinsky and I have created this work with a sense of respect for the public, and all we ask is that you give Just it. shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Return. Yes, respect, yes, and I, I guess they then applauded. And then after that, they applauded the and performance. Then, went then it went on. And Kenneth took me backstage and introduced me to Cocteau. Yeah. Which I had well, he was very there. approachable, you know, and he just kissed me on both cheeks from the first time I saw him. And he was always like an old, you know, my, my uncle or something. And he did give me the rights to film his ballet, the uh, Jeune Homme à Mort, the Young Man in Death. And I did film it in black and white, sixteen millimeter. In the garden, I couldn't do it inside because there were no lights with John Babillet and, and uh, his wife, Natalie Philippar, that created the thing in 1947 before, this was only three years after the ballet was created. And they were still very young, and so they still were completely believable as the, the artist who commits suicide by hanging himself because his model rejects him and then turns him to death and then march. Did you see the ballet? No, I, I saw a more recent color film of it. Well, even good. even Nureyev made a version of it. That I mean, no one could do it except the original dancers. Yeah. But even twenty minutes long, yeah, music by Nureyev, music by Bach, sets by Vakovich, choreography. Actually, even though it's Cocteau's idea, the choreography was by Roland Petit. And I, Cocteau, signed a letter, gave me the rights, I could make it, you know, this American kid coming over, you know, I mean, it's an amazing thing from Jew, but even with that letter, I went to see a dozen different producers, Paul Ve, uh, people that were, were known names of French producers, because I wanted to make the film on 35 millimeter Technicolor, 20 minutes, and everyone said, well, it's too expensive to do it in Technicolor for 20 minutes. I said, uh, uh, this would be the most expensive short ever made in France. And I said, well, it'll be rented forever. I mean, once it's made, it could just go on and on. It'll never get old or tired. I mean, I mean and the, the dancers will always be young. And so it isn't just like this season. It could be revived and revived, and every dance school in the world will, will want it. But I, even with Cocteau's letter and everything, I couldn't get the money together. And it was just agonizing. And I refused to make it on 16 millimeter. I had to be 35 even though I did film a, a test film in black and white 16 millimeter outdoors, where every time they take a step, you get a big cloud of, of it was so cold, a big cloud of steam from the, the dancers, you know, in, in uh, Jean Babillet's garden in, I think it was January, very cold in Paris. And uh, so that's kind of a weird movie in itself, but I won't show it. I mean, it's stored in the cinematype, but... It's not a real film, it's a study for a film, and it's too agonizing for me to see it. But, um, you know, I, I had a, a few opportunities like that, and then I wanted to film uh, Maldoror, the proto 
surrealist 19th century masterpiece written by Isidore Ducasse under the name of Lautrelon. And that would have been a feature three hours long, maybe in two parts. And I worked my ass off finding the sets, the, the places to film the, that suggested the 19th century. The ballet of the Marquis de Cuevas agreed to work with me, and I actually filmed part of the Hymn to the Ocean, Ima L'Ocean, it's one of the chapters in Deauville, when they were appearing down there. And we took tables from the casino and put them out in the water and held down the lake. Oh, they'd float away, but we held down the lakes with sandbags. And so they were like dancing on the water without any special effects. It looked like Jesus, you know, he was supposed to have walked around on the water. I, I'm not necessarily convinced that really happened, but that's what they claim they saw. At any rate, uh, and so they would have to leap from one table to the other and land, you know, and, and it was like six inches under the surface of the water. It was very tricky, and it looked beautiful. But it was only a few minutes of the finished film. You know, I mean, I couldn't find the money to do it. It was uh, money has has been uh, I don't know about Curtis, but it's been a like my bet noir my whole life. I've never had enough. I mean, a few times I've had a little bit. I've had a couple of grants from, from the like the National Endowment for the Arts and so forth. And I got a, an early grant from the Ford Foundation, but it was like twelve thousand dollars. I needed twenty thousand dollars, not twelve. I mean there were always the money was always never enough. And so I I would end up making a little short film when I would rather have made a longer one. But you know, I mean I, I'm not complaining. It's just I didn't ever know how to manage money. Like that side of of hustling for money is like alien to me. It's very difficult. And if I'm turned down I won't go back. In other words, if someone says, get lost or, you know, forget it, then I just sort of throw the script away. I, I'm not interested in, like, Oliver Stone had a script for plat Platoon under his arm when he came back from Vietnam, and he was peddling that thing persistently for 20 years before he finally got a producer to accept to film it. And he wouldn't have any career at all if that first film wasn't sold. But I could never stick with an idea for 20 years like, uh, you know, I mean, you have to believe in it. I would get, I'd get to hate it so much. <clears throat> so I, that's my flaw, that I, I haven't been able to raise the money myself. And, and um, Since we only have a few minutes left, I thought maybe we could just cover a couple of times that you have spent together. When you were in Europe, you said that you went to Venice together, is that right? No, we didn't go there together. We, we were there at the same time. We were there at the same time. That's when you no, made assignation. Never, we never traveled together. It no. Just, okay. it, we happened to be in the same, like I was living in Paris for a while uh, after Kenneth had arrived there. And Kenneth, very kindly, was the person who introduced me to Mary Mearson and Langlois, you know. And uh, so I got to know them. Uh, Kenneth introduced me to a number of people because he knew a lot of people there. I didn't know anyone when I arrived. So your paths crossed again when you were in Venice? Yeah, that was later on. I was there. Isn't, for, isn't that one. you went there one time and you made assignation? You didn't go there more than once, did you? Twice. Oh, you did oh, yeah, go twice. I did go, go twice, yeah. So the first time was sort of to get the feel of the place? Well, no, I went there the first time. Uh, I went there as a journalist to be uh, to write a, a, a reportage on the Venice Film Festival. No, I went to the Venice Film Festival too. Probably wasn't the same year. I don't think it was the same year because I, that was that through Langlois. That I yeah, like I went to the Cannes one one year, and then the Antibes Film Festival. That was his own festival in the little town of Antibes. That was terrific. Wasn't that the film OD? That's no, no, that was in Biarritz. Oh, that was before I came to France. That was uh, in 1949. That's when Cocteau gave me the prize for poetic film, for uh, fireworks. And he wrote me a festival de film uh, yeah. yeah, and he wrote me I a read about it. he wrote me a hand penned letter by signed John Cocteau with a little star that said it comes from the in French it sounds better than in English it comes from the beautiful night of the soul, your film, you know, that it's like a pure 
thing coming from that. So, and so I said I had to, to myself, I said I have to meet that, this man. <clears throat> and so it was the motivation for me going to France, you see. And luckily my grandmother more or less paid my way over, you know, one way on the... It wasn't first class, it wasn't second class, it was like third class, but it's still pretty great third class in those days. I mean, the food was great on the French line. Well, before we drop the subject, I wanted to go back to Curtis and the, and the film The Assignation. How did that come about? And well, I, this was a second trip. Uh, I think I was at you the... you remember the year? I think I, I think it would have been in, in the... Um, it would have been... Uh, you know, I'm, 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 I am confused. I, I went to the Venice Film Festival to show <coughs> Nighttide in 1961. And then I went to Paris and I showed it to Mary and, and uh, Henri. I think that I did it then. I think that's when I had my Bolex camera with me. Because I know I didn't do it the first time I was in Venice, which was around 1952. I was there the year of the uh, introduction to the world of Kurosawa's film. Um, that was a momentous event in the history. So did you find the costume for it and the actors right there? Uh, yes. Or did you bring them there? No. I, I found everything there. I met a, 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 a Venetian a young man in, in Venice who was, in point of fact, uh, worked part of the time as a gondolier. And I, I took lessons from him in gondoliering. He was teaching me how to do this. You know, it, you can go straight forward with just one paddle. It's very tricky. And he, he taught me that. He is the, he is the figure in the, the bauta. They call that costume the bauta. That's a with the mask? 18th century carnival costume. <clears throat> Cheek, cheek, cheek corner hat and the mask. mask and the black cloak and so he's, he is in the cloak but, but the, uh, and then uh, I had met uh, a um, through some friends I had met a very wealthy British fellow named Arthur something or other, I can't remember his name and he loaned me the gondolier and the two gondoliers that are in the film, and, and that was the costumes they wear in the film, are his livery for his. But his the people mansion. that the rich people in Venice who have their own gondoliers, it's like having your own limousine with your drivers. They're dressed in traditional yes. uh, costumes that go back to the 18th century. In other words, beautiful costumes. Beautiful. So it isn't yes. like they have some modern twentieth uh, century thing. They, yeah, everything the, the reflect, private like houses it's have the, the, private the way costume. the gondoliers dress, uh, particularly the rich people that have their own gondolier. <clears throat> they dress of the period of the gondola. See, the gondola is a beautifully shaped boat, maybe the most beautiful ever carved from. 17th century? I don't know how far it goes back. 16th century? But I mean, whatever that period is, it's, it's uh, so... So that, the figure of, of the gondolier and the back. boat go together. And then uh, I had my camera, and uh, I filmed it. And uh, I found this, the, the, the girl, I, I, uh, I, I've never forgotten her name, because it was, it was right out of a Puccini opera, Vanna Vianello. <laughs> so Vanna Vianello was the girl, very pretty red-headed girl, who played the girl at the end of the story. And uh, I just had this very simple idea of uh, death going to an assignation with the maiden, that, that traditional theme of death and the maiden. And I used the Bauta because of its, its sinister connotation as a kind of a death figure. And he held... And then the, the light motif of the film is he rode in the gondola to the assignation with the girl. He's holding a single red rose, which begins as a bud. And as the ride takes place, the, 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 the rose opens. And then when he finally gives the girl the gift, the death gift, 
the petals of the rose fall because the rose is, is dead by then, and dies. And you see the petals fall, and then he embraces her, and that's the end of the film. Sounds a little like Poe. Yes, so in the so, spirit of Poe. And the title, I used the title of Poe's story, even though my story was not related to his story so, again. I used so Curtis, uh, he has the image of death or the figure of death and fragment of seeking, and, and it's a thematic thing that reoccurs. So it isn't yeah. like, it isn't like, it, it, it's a um, recurring theme in your work. Very much so, yes. <laughs> as, as you saw the other day at, at USC. And all of, th that imagery, I think every artist's imagery comes out of your unconscious, and it's, uh, it's very compelling, but you don't, it's not something you bring up into your conscious mind all the time. And Kenneth, you mentioned when you were in Venice and you were spending time together, at a certain point you had lost Curtis, and you... Well, he doesn't remember, but he, he had gone maybe to get away from me. He was <laughs> hiding in the back room of a cafe, to, completely out of sight, obscure. And I found him by turning on my radar. You know, I go on automatic pilot like a dog can do. And I just followed my radar, and there... I went right in, and there he was in that back room. And there was not one way in a million in a million that I, it could have been a coincidence, and that's proof of my occasional ability in telepathy. It doesn't mean I always have it or it served any purpose. And he doesn't remember a thing about it, so I could be making it up, but I'm not. No, I don't think you're making it up. No. Okay. I just don't. Well, you were rather startled but I remember, when, I, when I walked I, in. I'm sure I was. Yeah. <laughs> well, I remember once I got a message from you. I wonder if you yeah. remember it. Yeah. The same similar thing yeah. where I read your mind, and you were very startled. I don't know if you remember this. Uh -huh. It was just, it was in Paris, yeah. and you were in a, in, in a hotel near the something in, you know, uh, the gardens in... In, in Saint-Germain? Yeah, yeah, you were in a hotel there. Uh -huh. And, um, and I, I knocked on the door of the room. I hadn't seen you for a while. I don't even remember why I went there. And I looked at you, and you, you answered the door. Yes. It was a period where you were being secretive, and I, didn't, I wasn't in touch with you, and so on. And I looked at you, and I said, are you going someplace... Huh? And you had this secret plan to go to Egypt? Yes. And you were so startled. You went, uh, 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 no, no, I'm not going any place. <laughs> and then, you know, a few days later, I found out that you'd left for Egypt. Uh -huh. Do you well, remember once, that? Once you came to see Elliot Stein, and I was actually in the room hiding under the bed. Oh, that I don't know. Yes. <laughs> but, well, you never knew I was there. No, I'm sure I didn't. I, I wanted to listen to, to what you two would say to each other. He was a rather <laughs> interesting chap. Yes. He was yes, started he, out. He, had, I recently talked to him in New York. You have? Yeah. yeah. Well, we don't speak anymore. Um, and when you were in Paris, you went to the Pierre Lachaise Cemetery together. I think so. Okay. I think I, we went together yeah, to the I think cemetery. So. And yeah. I remember. Uh, I think that was the day you you we went to Montant. and it was a workers' neighborhood, you know. And I remember we went to lunch there, and I think you'd been there before, and I'd yes, never I been certainly. there. And it was so down and so... Well, it was so French. I mean, it's so much like... But there like, was a movie uh, called... Americans would never go to Menil Montan. It was period. called... Um, Kirsinov made a movie called... Yes, I know. A, a, a yeah. silent film, beautiful silent poetic film. Filmed there. Brilliant film. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, we've, we've covered some of the same territory. And, of course, Curtis played Cesar the uh, sleepwalker in uh, Pleasure Dome. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of our idea together, I don't know how it came, everyone, well there'd been a, a party in Malibu at a, a mutual friend's house, sort of a Halloween party, and so I decided to sort of take advantage of all, all these people that already had their costumes, <laughs> and Curtis had a, a black thing with a white face, you know, looking like, um, Cesare, and, well looking like Conrad Veidt, one of your yeah. idols, yeah. or at least Absolutely. he used to be your idol. He's, well he's still one yeah. of my favorite actors yeah. of all time in the movies. Right. Yeah, had a wonderful presence. One of the greatest faces yeah. in the history of film, I think. You know, I, I had this very curious experience about about five years ago, four or five years ago. I don't know if you ever met this fellow, and I don't know his name, but there is a fellow, very obscure. I met somebody who knew him. He makes 
little doll-like figures mm -hmm. that are sold in in these uh, to fans. You know, he'll do a figure of Karloff as the monster and a figure of Yeah, Martin. right. And he took me to his workshop, and uh, uh, it was an extraordinary experience. And, and, and he made me feel very privileged. He said he does not let people come there, and I've told him about you, and I, can, and I just went there this once. The only point of my story besides that it was so extraordinary to because he does uh, figures that move too, little oh, automatons. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, yeah. some of them. He does some automatons. And did he have one in Conrad Weiss? His Weiss? favorite f face is Conrad Weiss. Oh, yeah. He had all kinds of sculptures of mm -hmm. Weiss' face you know, mm -hmm. that he'd done. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. A little Weiss figure. Yeah. And a, you know, he was, he's just obsessed with this. He had a wonderful face, face and he, it's really the reflection of the whole. Of, German silent film in his face, you know, because he played so many parts back then, starting with Caligari, which is just such a classic. Yeah. And, and, uh, and if, you, if, you, if you've seen him in his Hollywood era in a woman's face with Joan Crawford, have you ever seen that? It was wonderful. And he, and he ends up in Casablanca, doesn't he? Yes, yes, he's yeah. in Casablanca. He had quite a career. Yeah. And when he was buried at Forest Lawn, the minister there didn't know him from Adam. And at his funeral, he mispronounced his name horribly. Like it wasn't Veit, it was like Veit or something like that. Oh. Yeah, oh, it, was, okay. it was humiliating. Oh, that they never. Uh, well, at least Conrad he's, he's was there to hear it. He's one of the icons in the history of yeah. motion pictures. One of the and great he's, he's very, movie very faces, for us, you know, Glendale. Like, from the early silent German cinema coming into the, there was a whole period where he was appearing in British films in the early 30s, and then he finally came to Hollywood at the end of his career and appeared in a number of, and, and one of the great ones, of course, was The Thief of Baghdad. Oh, fabulous. Where he's so wonderful. Yeah. He plays the villain. I think I was luckier than you because I became quite friendly. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not a name dropper. I really hate that. But I, I really did become quite friendly with Michael Powell. Oh. I was lucky. But, I see. But, yeah. And, and that's how I... I met him once. That's how I um, got in touch with his cameraman, you know. The, and, and he told me wonderful stories about working on, uh, working with Viton. Thief of Baghdad. Um, I know there were several directors that worked on it. Well, yeah. But uh, he did most of it? Look, yeah. Ludwig Berger did a couple of days' work, but his name is on there, but most of it's Michael Pond. I see. It's a wonderful film. Yeah. So I, I guess I only have one last question. So, Curtis, you're Aquarius. No, you're Virgo, right? And yes. Kenneth, you're Aquarius, correct? Mm -hmm. How do you think that's affected the years of your relationship together and the dynamic between the two of you. A Virgo and an Aquarius? Yeah. Well, we don't, what do you mean? I mean, we don't, we, don't, we know each other. Uh, I'm a very stormy, difficult person to get along with, and often I will be quarreled, be not really, I won't see someone for 10 years or whatever, you know, but I still feel uh, an affinity with Curtis and certainly with his independent work. But uh, we're like um, ice and fire, as far you know, the, the two uh, <coughs> signs are quite different. Yeah, I'm, I'm an earth sign. Yeah. And, and like Aquarius an is an air sign, it's not a water yes. sign. People think it's a water sign because Aquarius is the water bearer, but it's, right. it's an air sign. And then I'm was born at midnight when Scorpio was ascendant. That makes me Scorpio rising, which is a very difficult sign because it's the scorpion and all that. And, and, and it's like a conflicted sign. I don't know what, what your birth I have sign a, is. I have a Capricorn rising. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. Well, you know, some people say that uh, astrology is just a bunch of bullshit. But, and our, see, luckily for us, artists can believe, like I very interested in astronomy, in black holes and all that stuff. But Crowley said you can believe in two completely different systems, like you can believe in fairy tales and believe in science at the same time, and both are equally true. 
and there's no conflict. And for artists, that can be true. And that's so. I don't say, well, how can you believe it? Be so stupid to believe in astrology. Like, do you read your horoscope in the, in the paper every day to see what you do? No. But there is something to it, even though you know. It, 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 I've had more coincidences happen and things like uh, right now we're having a, an eclipse of the moon at this very moment and I feel, I feel all, you can't see it, it's over there, it's in the east <laughs> a total eclipse you see, now Cameron I'm going to have to go Cameron was a, a, moon, a moon you know Cameron our friend she was a moon worshipper and she wouldn't do anything without consulting her horoscope and everything and she like, she wouldn't go out of the house on eclipse days and I would, you know, tease her a little bit. I said, well, oh, come on, it's only a shadow on the moon. And she said, oh, the eclipse, the eclipse. And she would get out of this state. And she, you know, burn little fires, things in her room, little incense and things in the eclipse. Well, people have their belief systems. Yeah, right. They can be extremely powerful. And they're very look at the ancient. Mus- look at these fanatical Muslims that are trying to destroy everything they can get their hands on. Yeah. It's all a belief system. It has nothing to do with reality whatsoever. Absolutely nothing. They yeah. worship a rock. You know, they go to Mecca. There's a meteor that fell thousands of years ago. There's nothing but a big rock from outer space. I mean, you know, they fall over the world. They put it in this black box in the mid- and they call it the Kaaba, and they march round and round and round this old rock. And it's, you know, it's like laughable, except they believe it. And so it means something to them. And it's not even Allah. You know, they're worshiping a rock that Belief fell from the sky. Belief power, you see. It's a, it's a, but of course it's... A, I'm very opposed to all organized religion and all belief systems. In case you want to this was the woman that. All right, well, That's thank you very much. Oh.